welcome to our very last uh, presentation, to our close presentation of our Tessena Fest online conference with a special guest presentation. Before that, just a small reminder, I will put it also into our chat here on Microsoft Teams, or you can read it on our Tessena Fest stream webpage. But if you want to ask anything to our last speaker, please use Slido for it. Even code is still the same, which means hashtag. I'm delighted to have a lot of questions there. OK, so now let's talk about how testers will save artificial intelligence. Intelligence. James Whitaker will show us the future of artificial intelligence and what software testers need to do right now to help the world achieve a better future. Maybe, maybe you will get also some tips for your own career as well. So I think, James, the stage is yours. All right. Thank you very, very much. I appreciate being here. I hope everyone is um, is having a, a great conference so far. Uh, it's weird being at a conference where I haven't met anybody yet. Um, but you know, th these things uh, happen. It's a it's a weird time. So. I want to talk to you guys uh, about your future specifically. There is a lot going on in the world right now, and it reminds me of the world that existed in the 1990s. Um, in the 1990s, we were going under a very through a very similar transition. We were going from a world driven by paper and ink that that everybody understood and that required a lot of people. Um, there's, a, there's a bunch of things popping up on my screen here, so sorry. Uh, and, and we were transitioning to this world of technology and this world of software. James, and, sorry to interrupting you. I, I don't know if you are projecting something, but we cannot I see. am not projecting anything except ah, myself. I, I know it's not much to look at, but I, <laughs> I will project something at, okay. at some point, uh, but that some point is not now. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. This is just going to be story time for a while. Uh, the 19, so back to the, to the 1990s, um, when software began to eat into the uh, paper and ink economy, uh, there was a lot of demand for technical talent. There was a huge career moves to be made in moving from whatever you were doing before into software. I think the most successful economists of the 80s pivoted to technology in the 90s. Uh, and if they didn't, they weren't all that successful. I think the most uh, uh, successful accountants who are, are the ones who learned to code and started writing accounting software. I think the most successful in any industry were the ones who pivoted to software because they saw it coming and they understood that it's going to need technical expertise. It's going to need uh, a domain expertise and accounting and economists, economy and all, all this. Um, it, it was a big deal. And so now we are facing a similar transition from the software economy to an AI economy. And I'm going to differentiate between the two because they are indeed different. There's almost the, the exact same level of superiority of AI over software that software had over paper and ink. Understand that software solved a certain class of problems that paper and ink couldn't solve. Well, they could solve them, but software could do it a lot faster. Software was really good at those repetitive tasks that you had to hire a lot of humans to do. And humans are expensive and software was way cheaper than humans. So a lot of money was invested in writing software that replaced all of those kind of low level clerical tasks. And by the late 1990s, most of those low level clerical, clerical tasks were gone. They were all done by software. And now fast forward to 2020, and there's almost none of those low level clerical tasks being done now. All of those humans have been worked out of the, the chain of effort by software. Now, AI, 
there, there's always been this class of problems that software couldn't solve. Even though software put millions of humans out of work, changed the way people did work forever, there was always this class of problems that software couldn't solve. And those were the problems that required human reasoning. Software just couldn't go there. It could assist. It could take a human artist and make them better. It could take a human engineer and make them better. It could take a human architect and make them better. But it couldn't replace the human. You know, if you think about a car, software was able to do a bunch of stuff, right? With uh, cruise control, software, blind spot detection, software, um, all the sensors to check fluid levels, software. Software could do a bunch in the car, but it couldn't drive it. Think about it. Think about programming that big ass if then else statement, that big ass case statement, that big ass switch statement, that big ass lookup table, however you want to code it, for going through a roundabout or going through a four way stop. Just sit and try to write that code. You can't. That if statement is infinite because it depends on the conditions on the ground. So, Software was never able to replace a human driver. That took AI. AI can replace a human driver because AI, I don't know if anybody's from uh, Amsterdam, but I'm drinking uh, a mug. I gave a talk there a long time ago. And they gave me a mug. It's my favorite mug. It's early over here, so you all don't get the beer lecture. You get the coffee lecture. AI can drive a car. How? Why is it that you can you can't program a software to drive a car through a four way stop or a roundabout, but you can program an AI? One reason is because AI is not programmed, and this is one of the ways that U.S. software testers need to start changing your thinking. We don't program AI; we train it. It's very similar to training another human to drive, which maybe we've all done. Uh, I've taught my kids to drive. I've taught uh, little, my little sister to drive. I've taught taught other people's kids to drive. I teach taught people to drive, right? So you you sit with them and you show them how it's done. You drive through a four way stop and you kind of explain the rules, but they still can't navigate a four way stop. They have to go through another one, and another one, and another one. Right, they have to deal with people who don't obey the rules that just kind of roll through the four way stop. They have to deal with all these things that, that, that they don't have experience for. So. That's the way we train AI, except, of course, AI doesn't sit with us in some robotic form uh, that we can talk to and interact with. AI learns from data. So that's the first step in AI is taking this problem that we have and reducing it to data. All of the sensors in a car, all the cameras at intersections, they watch cars go through four way stops. They communicate with each other. They understand what the data looks like of an orderly four way stop or an orderly roundabout. They understand what the data looks like for a wreck in a roundabout and a, or, or disobeying the rules of a four way stop and they begin to learn that through experience, experience with data, just like humans learn through experience. So that's the difference. We don't program an AI, we program software. We train an AI. I learned the power of this sort of uh, um, experimentally. I decided I would figure out if I could train my hot tub to maintain itself. And so the first step is to collect the data. And, and so I bought a bunch of sensors, sensors for water level, sensors for to detect the, the, the chemicals in the, in the water. Everything that I did as a human to maintain my hot tub, purchasing chemicals, adding chemicals, checking chemicals, adding water, changing all that stuff, opening and closing the lid, all that stuff, everything that required a human, I began to reduce to data 
through the acquisition of sensors, just like your car now can see, it can hear, it can, it can understand what's going on internally, it can understand its environment in which it works, it can, it can see all around it. And after I got all those sensors done, it, it began to amaze me. Um, I saw that it knew when I got in it because the water level rise was consistent with me. And so I was like, oh, well, that's, you know, that's me. And it understood. And, you know, my daughter would get in. I'm like, oh, that's my daughter. My son would get in. Ah, oh, that's my son. And it began to understand and it began to, to, to know, right? It, it, I would order chemicals. It would have access to my data from ordering chemicals. And it figured out on its own how to save money on chemicals, what time of the year to order them, whether to stock up, whether to just buy a little. It understood the sales because it had enough data over the months and months and months of me buying chemicals that it took over that task for me. Opening and closing the lid, all of that stuff. And, and of course, um, now it's completely self-maintaining. I do very little except uh, it, it still, it doesn't have opposable thumbs, so I still have to wipe it down occasionally. So crazy interesting problems that we can solve with AI that we can't solve with software. So why does this remind me of the 90s? This reminds me of the 90s is because I don't know how to test AI. Just like in 1990, I didn't know how to test software. No one knew how to test software. We were proceeding through this conversion of the paper and ink economy to the software economy at a rate that was terrifically fast. And we kept making mistakes. You would install software and it wouldn't work on your system. You would, you would start using software and you'd hit a bug. And, and we realized, all right, this is, a, this is a serious problem, but software industry was making enough money that, that we could create a, a new role. And software testing was an actual role. By, it wasn't an activity. It used to be a developer would code something up, test it themselves, put it out there, and it was too buggy because the developer didn't understand the problem of buggy software. The role of software testing. Software testing was so important. Software quality was so hard to get right that it wasn't just an activity that the developer could do. It was a role, a separate role that a separate human programmer would take on. And it was the golden age of software testing. I mean, we made the same amount, uh, uh, the role of software testing, we made the same amount as software developers uh, uh, and, and um, and, and we discovered some some pretty amazing stuff, but we did it on purpose. It wasn't it, it, it was because software testing was its own separate role. Uh, my, I don't know if you can hear that. Sometimes people say they can't hear this stuff. But my dogs are playing uh, upstairs. I'm, I'm in my wine cellar and there's a, a glass floor up there that I could I could see them playing. And one of them's kind of big and one of them's kind of tiny and, and they like to fight. So anyhow, I'm, I'm probably going to be OK. Uh, they've both been out recently. I think I'm going to be OK. Uh, and, and so we went through this, this great age of sort of uh, uh, discovery with, with what we were doing and, and how we were doing it. And, and we realized that there was more to software than just finding bugs. Uh, it was me. These these happened to be my books that I wrote uh, over a, a 20 year period about software testing. Uh, the, the industry of software testing was all about figuring shit out. What is this problem that we're trying to solve? The techniques that you use today, I'm assuming that many of you all are are young. It seems like the the age demographic of a conference goer these days tends toward the young. I think probably the Probably the same when I was young. I just I didn't notice young people when I was young. I only notice them now that I'm not young. Um, trying to figure this problem out, and that's what we did at the conferences. I mean, and then now we have conferences where we okay, let me show you this technique. Well, that technique didn't exist in the 90s. 
there, we go to conferences now and they're like, here's a tool that you can use. Those tools didn't exist in the 1990s. We created them during this period. And, and these books, I'm going to come back and talk about one of these in a, in a minute when we get to AI. But these books aren't really about how to test, even though they are. They're really about how to understand the problem of software testing and then how to methodically deal with that. We were really good in the 1990s and early 2000s at knowing how software worked at a fundamental level, understanding how software worked. So, so this was this was key to to everything that we did um, uh, with with regards to you know our craft, and I will I will talk about talk about that in in a bit. So um, let me see, figure out how to unshare this. Now we're back. So the next real challenge was to understand, you know, what all can go wrong. You know, it was software testers that were the first ones that really sound the alarm about software security, uh, which was one of those books that I just popped up on the screen, uh, assuming that you all, all saw it. Um, in 1986, the very first security vulnerability in MS-DOS was released. It was called the Brain, and it was released from Pakistan because a couple of Pakistani developers had written some code and people were pirated it, pirating it, and they were pissed off. And so they injected a bug in it uh, uh, that purposefully modified the boot sector of the machines that it was installed on illegally. And they didn't realize how much pirated software was spreading and they ended up modifying boot sectors of, of computers all over the planet and right this is 1986 how many ms dos computers were out there it was a big deal if you were around at the time and that was the first time when we really began to understand hey what if people uh, sabotage software on purpose up to then, we were only working on software bugs that were accidental, that developers didn't mean to leave in the application. They didn't really understand these failure conditions, and so they wrote a bug that they shouldn't have, have, have written, but these were on purpose. And then we noticed as technology progressed, like in, the 1980, in 1986, you actually had to somehow acquire a disk that had that buggy virus ridden software in it. When AOL came out in the early 90s and all of a sudden we were dealing with network software, the first thing software developers did was, was break it. That's what we do. And someone wrote the first phishing virus. It was called, so instead of AOL, it was called AO Hell. Uh, you can Google it. And AO Hell would tempt you into entering a chat room and then start mucking around with your data, start reading your personal posts, so things like that, right? The classic phishing attack. The web came out, and then all of a sudden we had cross-site scripting vulnerabilities and 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 all of all of these sorts of so, sorts of things. I, I'm not gonna um, spend too much time on this history lesson. And it was software testers that were left to, to deal with these things. And so it isn't just finding bugs that we were doing in the 80s and in the 90s and the 2000s. We were understanding fundamentally how software worked and, and how to keep that shit on the rails. This is why we got paid as much as the people who wrote software. This is why we were an entire discipline and not just some activity that, that people have done. Y2K, when the Y2K bug, so for those of you that don't remember Y2K or might have even been born after Y2K, um, you know, computers dealt with a two digit math. So when the year 2000 came along, computers interpreted it as the year 1900 because it assumed the 19. And it was that bug that was really the prime time uh, for software testing. And we came through, we figured it out. 
we not only found those bugs, we figured out how to how to understand date math. And we were part of a problem that the entire world was was facing. So now fast forward to today, 2020, and it's no longer the case that software testers make as much money as software developers. It's no longer the case that software testing is its own role. It's an activity performed by people who have other titles. Their title is program manager. Their title is software developer. Their title is engineering manager. Their title is, is, is technical writer. Their title is user, beta user, whatever. There are still lots of people with the title software tester, but they don't make what they used to make. They're not taken as seriously as they used to be taken. And in all of the, the startups that I consult for, an IoT startup and an AI startup, none of them have the role of software testers. Microsoft, the company I, uh, the last big company I worked for, no longer has the role of software tester. If they do, there's maybe you can count them in singles or maybe dozens, tens, not hundreds. Google, the company I worked at before that, uh, did away with the software testing role while I was there. Software testing is an activity now. It has degraded in its visibility and its importance. And I would argue that it's partly the fault of the people who are practicing software testing. I am sorry, but it is because we have missed several technological changes. We didn't miss those changes in the 90s. We didn't miss network software. We didn't miss the web. But then by the time the late 2000s came, out, came along, we missed the cloud. There were no, there was no good software testing theory and understanding that came out of the software test community. It came out of the site reliability community. This is what I think fundamentally happened with software testing, is the, the talent, the techniques, the way that we were thinking about what was going on at the time, migrated into program management, it migrated into software uh, site reliability, it, it migrated into back-end cloud management, it migrated into all of these things and stopped becoming this contiguous whole that was software testing. And, and I think it's a shame. I think it's a shame that we missed mobile. We, 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 there's still a few really good companies that, that, that do mobile uh, software testing, but mostly mobile, you develop a mobile app, you just crowdsource the, the, the testing of it. And, and that testing has, has taken a hit uh, in, its, in its reputation and its uh, importance. And now we are in a world of artificial intelligence. And where is the understanding of what's going on with AI? So we are tracking in an AI world to what was happening in the 90s in software. As we transition from a software only world, I mean, there's still paper and ink, right? This stuff never really disappears. Software is never really going to disappear. It's just that all the important, interesting uh, things are going to <laughs> happen with AI and not with software because AI can reason and all software can do is repeat things really, 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 really efficiently. The same things seem to be happening. We are getting bugs in software and in AI that are beginning to cause me uh, some, some concern. And let me show you one here. If it will allow me to share my screen again. All right. I don't think it's allowing me to do it. Let me try it one more time. I think we found a bug. All right, so I'll just talk through it. There was a, a bug uh, that 
researchers found in Tesla Autopilot where they took a speed limit sign uh, of 35 and they put a little piece of tape on, on it to um, make the three look like an eight. The Tesla Autopilot read it as 85 and accelerated. And if you've ever been in a Tesla, they're pretty good at acceleration. Uh, it accelerated from 35 to 85 because someone had rigged the speed limit sign. So what does that mean for us? That means that we need to rethink how software, how, how AI works, because it is susceptible to the same types of bugs that, that software is susceptible to. And so if I could share my screen, let me try it one more time. No, it's not interested at all. Um, in How to Break Software, which was the first book on that list I just showed you, I had done a 10 year or so analysis of, of tens of thousands, probably hundreds of thousands of bugs. Me and my students did it when I was a professor at a university of what caused each of those bugs. And we found that there were four categories of bugs. There were bugs that occurred because of a direct input to a piece of software. There were bugs that occurred because of the software creating the wrong output. There were bugs because of internal manipulation of data. And there were bugs because the computation, the code was just wrong. Input, output, data, and computation. The hundreds of thousands of bugs we analyzed and we, we ended up boiling them, boiling them down to to uh, 19 different test cases that would find those classes of bugs that would help software testers think through those classes of bugs. I submit that this is the body of work, this body of work that we did in the 1990s to understand why is software failing needs to be redone now for artificial intelligence. We boiled the whole world of functionality bugs down to 19. We boiled the world of security vulnerabilities down to 17. We boiled the wor world of web vulnerabilities down to, I think it was 21, and, and developed the advice that hundreds of thousands of software testers all over the world used to find bugs. We haven't yet done that with AI. So that masking tape on the speed limit sign is that's a test autopilot is the ai if you want to call it software call it software it's not software it's learning it doesn't it wasn't programmed it learns from its environment and they missed a spot they misread a 35 mile an hour speed limit sign for an 85 mile an hour speed limit sign that's a bug so what one of you needs to do is understand that that's one of those things. It's one of those 19 types of functional bugs in software. It's one of those 17 types of functional bugs in, in, in uh, uh, software security. It's one of those 21 types of, of bugs. Maybe it's 23 for web. I forget. I haven't read my own books for a while uh, uh, for, for, for web vulnerabilities. What are they for AI? What are all the different ways that you can modify AI's environment to make it do things like accelerate incorrectly? But that's only part of it. You see, you can't really test AI the same way you test software. You can't test it as a black box. If you could, that would be great. You could just arrange all the cars, you could change all the signs, you could do all those tests. But there are other classes of bugs. Let's talk a little bit about how AI learns. AI learns from data. And, and so um, we, it, at Microsoft, we had a, a project called Tay. And the idea was to teach Tay to speak to people, to teach Tay to carry on a conversation. And they decided to reach, release Tay on Twitter. Now understand that the data that Tay had access to was pretty substantial. It was all of the voice samples of, so this is Microsoft product again, is all the voice samples of people speaking to Cortana, 
uh, both on on the Xbox, on on Windows Phone, back when Windows Phone was the thing, and uh, Windows, right? So we had all of these speech samples. Microsoft has been doing speech research since 1994. We had a ton of data to teach Tay how to talk. We understood how to build models to teach Tay how to learn speech. And it learned speech and it did really well. And then it got released into its environment. And you can Google this one too, if you'd like. Tay the racist chatbot, T-A-Y, Tay. Tay the racist chatbot. As soon as Tay got, so, so there's a bunch of bugs there, right? There's a bunch of ways that we could have broken Tay during the training process itself. And so there's a, gonna be a bunch of input bugs for AI, but there's gonna be a bunch of training bugs too. We, if you want to be part of thinking through AI for the future, you've got to understand how to build an AI. Do what I did with my hot tub, just build something. There's really, because you're not programming, there's not a ton of coding that, that's involved. Most of the data that I presented to my hot tub was in the form of Excel spreadsheets. Uh, it was not difficult. Most of the algorithms that I used were written by someone else and I just experimented with those. So we have this uh, uh, set of bugs that have to do with how we train the model, whether we picked the wrong, wrong or the right algorithm to, to do that. Uh, I had bugs in my uh, uh, system, uh, in my uh, hot tub a, a great deal. Sometimes it would close the lid on me. Uh, why did it do that? It didn't do that because of something I did at the time. It did that because it was mistrained. It wasn't completely trained. The scenario under which it closed the lid on me uh, was never part of its training. And, and so there's a bunch of uh, bugs there, but what happened with Tay was interesting because this was post-training. Once they put Tay up on Twitter, Twitter and Tay started talking to other people, other people began influencing Tay. Now, this is probably one of the, the greatest software testing, uh, AI testing, challenges of our time is figuring out things like what happened to Tay. You know, I taught both of my children to drive. They're both now in their early 20s and both of them are far better drivers than I am. How did that happen? It happened because they learned from me and then they continued to get better over time. However, it could have easily gone off the rails. I know a lot of people who complain, oh my God, my kid is a terrible driver. They, they speed too much. And what happens is they start learning from other people. They start learning from their friends. And all of a sudden their training is only a little bitty part of how they drive a car. That's what happened to Tay. Tay didn't, wasn't trained to be a racist chatbot. It started uh, spouting Nazi creed and, and, and started um, uh, blatantly calling for the murder of certain people, um, political figures, uh, because it was coaxed that way by the people it was talking to on Twitter. You know, you raise your children as good as you can. You put those kids out into the world and then the world is going to influence them. My, kids are in their 20s. They're not the people I created them to be. They're the people that I created them to be, plus all of the influences that they've gotten uh, since they, they moved out of my house. So that's what happened to Tay. How do we codify that? This is one of the most important things that, that, that we have to deal with with artificial intelligence is we train it to do a job, we put it out into its environment and all of a sudden it continues to be influenced. Those cars get better and better and better at driving as they, as they come up with more um, scenarios, as they experience more scenarios. How do we codify that? And why aren't we talking about this on a, on a grand scale? This is exactly what we did in the 1990s when networking, you know, we didn't have networked computers in the in the early 1990s. They were in their nascent form. We worked out how to test networked applications. We worked out how to test client server applications. We sat down and said, how is this different? What are the knobs that we have access to as software testers that we can test networked applications? Same with the web, same with the cloud. 
Who's doing that with AI? This is the grand challenge of the software testing field. How do we figure this out? How do we understand that that this how to how to, to, to rig this? So so let me go through a, an example of the last AI I built at the uh, IoT company uh, that I was working for. We needed to count the number of people in a room. All right, this is COVID. This is uh, uh, an application that they wanted to maintain social distancing. They wanted to limit the number of people in a room. Uh, they wanted to count the usage of a room. Uh, this actually started out as a big company wanting to uh, make sure that no people went in after hours and access control and things like that. How do you count people in a room with software? I submit that you can't. I submit that it's too difficult. I submit that software will never fully be able to count the number of people in a room. You would have to have some sort of access control where you badge in and then the software says, OK, there's one. But if it's all open and people are wandering through, it's going to be very difficult to count them. So the first thing you consider is data. How do I generate the data that allows me to count people in a room. Here's what we did. The first piece of data was a Wi-Fi access point. If, the, if a human walks in the room, chances are they have a phone. When the phone makes a connection to the Wi-Fi access point, whether they connect or not, it pings you. Now you know, right? Okay, there's a person in the room because we detected a device. That's one signal we can use, but it's a flawed signal. What if that person also has a watch that can connect to the internet? What if that person has a backpack in their in their um, uh, a laptop in their backpack, and it's set to continue to stay online even if it's closed? Now all of a sudden, that watch, that laptop, that phone—we've counted three people for only one. It's a flawed piece of data. What if? We also detected motion. If we see movement in a room, that means we just saw a person. Or did we? Maybe there's two people standing next to each other and they both walk by the sensor and we detect the movement, but well, we don't detect the movement of two people. What if the movement, what if there's a window in the room and, and the movement is actually outside the window? What if they've got a large dog like that's up here that walks by and triggers the motion sensor? incomplete data. What if we used a microphone, some sort of sound sensor? We detect the human voice. There's a person talking. There's a certain pitch to their tone. There's another set of voices that we hear with a different pitch. Two, two people, three people. OK, but what if they have a TV on? Um, what if it's a person outside the window and they're speaking loud enough that we can hear them and think they're in the room? See, the problem here is that it's very difficult to collect all this data and attach meaning to it with if-then-else statements. The way AI works, the way you solve that problem with AI, is now you have three sets of data. You have the, the Wi-Fi connection profile, you have the motion profile, and you have the sound profile, and we do what is called labeling. We tell the AI what the answer is. But those three profiles, Wi-Fi, motion, and sound, there's 15 people in the room. Here's another set of profiles, and there's 83 people in the room. Here's another set of profiles, and there's 1,000 people in the room. Here's another set of profiles and there's four people in the room. Here's a bunch of profiles where it's empty. And so there's this big data collection component, which can be very buggy. Each one of these, right, designing the, the data collection, uh, uh, making sense of the data, all of these things are just like how to break software, input, output, data computation. These are all the places that AI can go wrong. And you collect a bunch of data. So there's two ways to collect data. 
there's sensors like we have in this situation. And then there's also crowdsourcing. Uh, the way we trained Tay was to crowdsource people tweeting at us. We consumed a whole bunch of tweets. We took those tweets and converted them to speech. And we used millions and millions and millions of samples of those for our AI to understand what people were saying. When it was wrong, we corrected it. If you all haven't taken part in being a member of an AI crowd, there's an app called Nevo out there, N-E-E-V-O, that actually pays you for this, for distribute to, to contribute to data uh, as part of the, the crowd. It would be a good experiment to do that, to get used to the idea that AI is learning from us. All of this sensor data as well, cameras, microphones, all of these sensors in cars, they are collecting data. We need to understand how that can go wrong. So we had literally tens of thousands of these samples of each of these three profiles of data together labeled with how many people were in the room. The AI <laughs> began to then guess how many people were in the room with astonishing accuracy, but it was still wrong in several cases. This is another case where software testing comes in. How can the labeling go wrong? How can data be mislabeled? How can data be, how can we improve the, the labeling of data? In each of these tasks in creating an AI, there is a task in correcting that AI. That, I believe, is the role of software testers going forward. How do we do this? What does it mean? So we go through in collecting these three profiles of, of data. We label it with the answer that we want the AI to generate if this was the problem. And then we train the model, and this is the next step. Selection of an algorithm to train the model. That can go wrong. Just like by, by miscoding a piece of software, you can inject bugs. By selecting the wrong algorithm, you can develop a buggy AI. There's three types of algorithms. There's statistical algorithms, some of these statistical algorithms have been around for hundreds of years, right? This is Bayes, Bayesian algorithms. These are, are regression analysis algorithms. These are, if, if there is a, a, a uh, par parental discipline of AI, it's statistics. Statistics is where all of this stuff came from. The only problem is before computers, statistics only existed on paper and in the minds of really brilliant mathematicians. And now statistics exists in computers and in the minds of AI that can understand it. Uh, that's the lowest hanging fruit, statistical algorithms. Run all those algorithms on the data. And here's what a software AI testers, I need to stop calling them software testers, but it's a familiar term, so I'll keep using it. This is what software testers need to understand. These algorithms, what types of data are they good at or bad at? Because there is a large class of bugs that are simply exist because the wrong algorithm was you, was matched to the wrong set of data. And then the answers are generated. And here's where it gets even harder. What if those answers are wrong? How do we debug AI that we really don't even understand? Because to this day, I do not know how that algorithm, how th that software, that AI that counts people in a room gets it so damn right so often. We, we, we've had it counting the number of people in, in conferences and we compare the number of people who go in the room to the, and it gets it correct. We install it in restaurants that we know how many we can count the number of people on a clicker as they go in. We can look at the cash register and see exactly how many people were in the room and it's correct. How did it do that? And this, I think I've only got a couple minutes left before the Q&A session start. This is the grand challenge. How do we keep AI? How do we keep up with AI? AI is going to be doing things that we cannot 
do. AI has already selected chess, chess moves that no human has ever selected before. AI can count people in a room and no human can say this is how it happened. Cars can make mistakes when they're self-driving and the diagnosis of those bugs is something that we might not ever get our minds around because AI isn't programmed. We need to figure out, just like we figured out in the 90s, debuggers and, and loggers and, and, uh, and, and error files, how to log AI to understand what it's doing and keep on keeping up with it. Because AI will do things that are very human-like. It will reason in ways that only humans can reason. And your job as software testers is to figure that out. My name is James Whitaker. Thank you for attending. I think we have a Q&A session now that will be hosted by Marcel, perhaps. And um, I want to leave you with one additional thought as well, is that I didn't even cover things like bias in the data. I didn't even cover maliciousness in, in the training uh, and subsequent training. Um, th these are, are big fields. And if you can look at what's happening in AI and see opportunity, you're finally thinking right. When I looked at software in the 90s and saw I can either be a developer or a software tester, I wanted to be a tester because to me that's where the interesting problems were. That's where the big meaty contributions that we can make. And certain, sure, sure enough, Y2K came around and proved me right. It was software testers that helped the world get through that. AI will have its Y2K moment. Something will happen where the potential for AI to go off the rails will become so big and, and you can dream about it if you want. You can imagine it starting wars. You can imagine it, whatever. You can imagine those things. You need to be there for that. And it's not going to be AI developers who are there for that. They're too busy. They're just like in the 1990s. They're too busy doing their thing to take this higher level view of understanding what is this entity. That's your job. Go do it. Peace. Hi, James. Hey, Marcel. Good to see you, man. Yeah, it's a long time. <laughs> it's been a long time. How are you? I am so good. So good. Welcome to my booze room. <laughs> nice one. We have some questions, and uh, Tomas is hosting this uh, today uh, uh, one, two, three event. So maybe let's uh, first go through the questions, and Tomas will read it, and then uh, I hope we will have some time for discussion with the guys who are brave to unmute or maybe even turn on the cameras. All right, so do I get to pick and choose from these questions? Because some of them were pretty good. Uh, let me just go through them until people people figure out if they want to uh, want to talk. Most interesting working experience was by far um, working on the Y2K problem. Uh, it's a long story to tell, uh, but we made a ton of money. We boiled Y2K down to its essence, and, and this is, gets to the heart of my talk, is that that's what software testers do. We boil things down to their essence and we come up with really elegant solutions for extremely hard problems. So it was Y2K. There was videos of me out there on YouTube telling this story. Um, uh, check it out. How many T-shirts do I still have? So I, I no longer make these. These were kind of a Microsoft thing. Um, <laughs> uh, I sold these for for years. You can see that it's, it doesn't really say shit. I'm the eye. That's my profile. Uh, I still have a few of them upstairs, but uh, I, I don't don't uh, do this anymore. It was kind of a, a thing I did for, for Microsoft. Um, let's see what else we got here. Uh, come to Paris. Yes, I have to come to Paris. I can't wait till I can travel again. I was in, I was actually in Paris as one of my last um, uh, last international destinations in December 2019 before COVID hit. It was it was lovely. Uh, so data scientists, you, you mentioned this is this is I really believe that 
where programmers were the um, kind of the penultimate uh, career for the software era. Data science is going to be the penultimate career for the AI era. And so if you're not already taking classes in data science and trying to train, train yourself into data science, uh, all software testing is going to, to, and AI testing is going to expand from that. We are going to stop using the term software tester. Uh, it won't be long. I don't know if it'll be two years, five years, or 10 years, but we won't be talking about software testing in, in 2030. You're going to be regarding data this, I would ask you something uh, more. Who yeah, will the traditional job first, testers or developers? <laughs> Well, I mean, you got to test it. It's got to be created in order to to test it. Uh, but it's kind of a chicken and the egg thing because you know you got to understand how you're going to test it before you develop it. But unfortunately, no one does that. So so developers are 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 first in the in developers the, are first losing the traditional kind of. Unfortunately, approach. that's the, the the reality of the situation. <laughs> you are telling us this because you are on the testing conference, right? <laughs> no, I'm telling you because it's true. Um, really? Let's see what else is here. Uh, all right, I'm going to take that Patrick one's Patrick's last because that was kind of uh, I don't know how much time we have for this. There now is no, nobody else test. after you. This is the closing session, so we have so much time. You have. Okay, cool. Um, so if we took analogy to security testing, there are some norms and certifications. I don't know if we're going to certify an AI or not. The problem with an AI is that you you build it, software, you build it, and it doesn't change until humans update it, right? You build it, and it does what it does, and it keeps on doing what it does. It, it Its binary footprint remains the same. AI does not. The minute AI starts communicating with its users, it learns from those users. Uh, you know, the, the self-driving cars are getting better as they drive. Every day they get they get better. My hot tub gets smarter about its chemical mixture every single day. Um, I, you know, that we're, the AI that counts people in a room gets better every single day. And and so what are the norms of this? Um, I really think that those things, it's really a safety. You know, and we talk about safety critical software. We talk about, we talk about um, you know, resilient software. Maybe we'll talk about things like self-healing AI, and um, I, I don't know. This is this is a, a grand time to be to be thinking about these things. Do you think we need an equivalent to AI sort of anti-bias proof algorithm, inclusiveness, ethical aspects? We need a code of honor, I think, for AI development. Uh, AI is 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 easier to build which lowers the bar so you, let me clarify that it's not easier to build now but it will become easier to build now you've heard of these low code and no code ai training systems um, i believe eventually they will become the norm the code already exists for ai the code is embedded into the uh, algorithms that process all that data all that labeled data and build a model um, and it will, you know, deploy, deploy this in the car, deploy this in the building, deploy this in a toaster, deploy this in an oven, deploy this in the television, deploy this on some hardware platform. So ultimately, I think it's going to get far easier to build AI than it is to build software. And therein lies a problem because we've lowered the bar to a point where anybody can do anything they want. And so at this point, I think we need to start thinking about exclusion of certain sets of data. There are things maybe we don't want the machines ever to learn. There are certain things that that we don't want the machine, certain problems that we don't want machines to ever solve. And now's the time to begin thinking through those ethical as aspects of, of AI. The World Economic Forum, I've just become a part of their think tank on, on AI. And these are the sorts of things that we've been talking about is, you know, and where are your opportunities to fence AI? Um, are there certain things, can you train an AI to ignore data that it's getting from the field? Because unlike software, AI does change. It's binary, if, if it will have one, it's binary will be different now 
as it is now, right? It's going to basically continuously update. These are really important problems. Patrick, would it be possible to train AI to test other AIs? Yeah, there's a, a test.ai. Uh, Jason Arbonne's company uh, is, is building AI to test software, and it's only a matter of time until I think you can test some aspects of what AI does. So many of the things AI does are very software-like, and within every AI, there is going to be embedded software. And so, um, uh, yes, I, I, I think it is. The, the really um, dangerous question there, Patrick, is would it be possible for an AI to build another AI, to train another AI? Now you're getting to a truly frightening aspect of AI where the machines are literally building themselves. <sighs> break AI, I'm, what do you mean by break AI? Do you mean slow it down, uh, con control it, make it stop? Uh, I, I think that it is it is a matter of, of people deciding that they're to, to keep AI in bounds. Um, and, and, you know, we're just beginning to think through that. In your opinion, what jobs will there be in the future? In my opinion, data scientists is the going to be the anchor um, role and skill set for the 2020s just like software developer was the anchor role and skill set in the 90s, uh, the noughts and the tens. So that will probably last in the 20s and, and into the, the 30s. How can we raise our children or teach our AI so that the future interactions do not break them? Um, that's an existential and philosophical question of our time. I mean, I. I raised two children and put them out into the world and and you know tried to instill into them values and 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 um, and I, I succeeded in some ways and you know in other ways um, they have developed a sense of the world that I didn't have you know my children's views on relationships are way different than my reviews my views on relationships uh, my children are much more tolerant of things that than, than I am. And so it's going to be interesting to see if we end up having generational AI, you know, uh, having, you know, morals and values of the years in which it was was trained. It's going to be very interesting to see if, you know, my my hot tub still remembers its initial training. Um, can I take that initial training away? How do I do that? Do I just go back and delete all the data that is before, say, 2018? Um, will that work? Can I turn it off? Isn't this fun to think about? Is, is this, these are, uh, we are literally teaching machines to reason just like we teach our children to reason about the world. There are things that we control with the data. There are things that we can control with labels. There are things that we can edit with models. And, and then there's a bunch of stuff that's completely out of our control. Just like the peers that our children decide to listen to is completely out of our control. The things that, the, the, the places, the influencers that our children learn from is completely out of control. Same thing will happen with AI. And the last question, do you think that a new generation of hackers will emerge who will focus on hacking AI and getting money out of that? Yes, of course they will. Um, if if anything can be corrupted, people will corrupt it and they are going to be working very hard to corrupt it because just like software was so easy to hack in its early stages, so easy. I remember um, in, on Amazon, I, I showed this bug. This bug is in how to break software security. Uh, no, 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 it's in how to break web software. Um, it used to be that websites would store their code locally. And we went in uh, Amazon, an early version of Amazon.com in like, you know, 2001 and edited the page that the code was serving to change the quantity that we of, of an item that we were ordering to a negative number. And so then Amazon site multiplied the the 
cost of that item by a negative number, got a negative number, and put a rebate on our credit card. And you know we did that. You know that bug was there for anybody to exploit for you know some months before Amazon figured it out. Of course, you know that low-hanging fruit is gone because we've gotten smarter. And so the question is going to be, what is the low-hanging fruit in AI? And that is my message to you. You should be figuring out this stuff in advance. You have all of the work that we did as uh, as your um, you know fathers and grandfathers and mothers and grandmothers of software testing uh, to to look at in order to figure out AI. We didn't have anything. All we had was paper and ink, manual processes. We had to create all this stuff from scratch. You're not working, working from scratch, but you have a much harder problem on your hands. AI is going to be much harder to get under control than software. Okay, cool. We went through the, all the questions. I have a few more if you are still available or if you have a few more minutes time. Yeah, I'll take I'll take a couple more and then uh, and then I've got to get going to the rest yeah. of my day. Maybe the might require another cup of coffee. OK, Keep going. <laughs> OK, the, the question is uh, you went through uh, Microsoft and Google and this was kind of at least from my distance or from my side interesting journey. What is the next? interesting journey you are planning to make happen or are you already on some interesting journey now or are you staying in testing or are you moving somewhere else or i haven't what, been in testing since, the, the i haven't next... been in testing since 2011 i mean i've been yeah. testing mm -hmm. because you know it's a but because the, the point i made it's testing is no longer a role it's an mm -hmm. activity so i don't call myself a software tester even though i still do a, a lot of software testing um, you know, I work for two startups at the moment. I work for an, uh, a stealth mode IoT company um, that built the device that has the motion sensors and the Wi-Fi uh, access point and uh, microphones that I was talking about with the people counting app. I, uh, I also work for an AI company that does uh, crowdsourcing of uh, speech data and mm -hmm. teaches chatbots how to speak and, and how to work. Um, so, so uh, I'm I'm pretty busy with those two things right now. You know, post COVID, maybe I'll consider other other things. Um, but I do a lot of writing, uh, and I own a, a brewery and a restaurant here in in Seattle uh, that nice. that's, that takes up a, a lot of my time as well. So, it's more hobby now than the restaurant. Yeah, it's a, not a good time to have a, a restaurant, but we're 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 dealing with it. OK, so I don't know. I will maybe ask others if they want to join the discussion. Uh, I'll check whether we are still streaming. If there is anybody still on the stream and you want to join us, there is a link on our website. But I think we have maybe time for last question, right, James? Yeah, one more question. Who's one got more a good question one? from crowd if somebody would like to step in and ask. I still see 26 people on the call. Yeah. <laughs> on oh, wow. That's a big one. Uh, thank you, Milos. Uh, when do you see the singularity coming, if ever? So there's going to be there's three phases of AI. Um, uh, this is a different talk. Um, the, we're, we're in the first one now, um, which I call artificial narrow intelligence. We're going to be using AI to solve narrowly defined problems. Lawyers are going to be solving legal problems along with data scientists in the law field. Medical doctors are going to be solving medical problems along with data scientists in the medical field. Accountants, economists, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So artificial narrow intelligence, there's going to be a bunch of AIs to solve very specific uh, problems. Then the next phase will be artificial general intelligence where we build an AI and, I, and so I think if you wanted to just go on years, I think artificial narrow intelligence will be the 2020s. Um, during the 2020s, we will be working on 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 training an AI to be human. Uh, this is called artificial general intelligence. So artificial narrow intelligence for the 2020s, 
artificial general intelligence for the 2030s. And, you know, the, the, the Turing test um, will be passed, um, I think, fairly easily. But artificial general intelligence will simply be uh, a replacement for a human. Uh, it will be able to, to, to be indistinguishable from a human uh, simply because of the preponderance of, of, of data. And, and so it depends on how you define the, the singularity, whether you count that as the singularity or not. But I think the more interesting question is, will these AGIs ever actually become conscious? Whether they will become human? Um, I think they're gonna be really good at faking being human. They're really gonna be really good at convincing you they're human, but will they feel pain? Will they feel emotion? Will they, like us, become more than the sum of our neurons and cellular structure and DNA? Um, that's artificial conscious intelligence, and I think that's what we're going to be talking about in the 2040s. So artificial narrow intelligence now, artificial general intelligence a decade from now, two decades from now, artificial conscious intelligence. And this is a, a big field. Uh, what does it mean to be conscious? Uh, there, there's there's one, uh, I'm going to go here, but the, there's the, the theory of consciousness I subscribe to is the, the complexity. That if when, when the structure gets complex enough, consciousness occurs. And, and so if that's the, what we measure AI by, we'll have the singularity in the 2040s because the complexity of the neural networks are, and the depth of the of that structure is going to be to such a point that um, if the complexity theory of consciousness is correct, they will become conscious because their complexity will 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 far out uh, outstrip ours. What a great place to end this. <laughs> Thank you guys. Okay. Thank you very much for joining us. You're welcome. And uh, all the guys on the call and on the stream have a Nice evening. It's 7 p.m. here. So the day is over. Thank you very much for attending our conference. It was running over entire month and this was very nice closing talk. So thanks, James. Join all right. Us. I hope to see all of you all one time in, in some time in the future in person when it's uh, safe yeah. to be out again. So yeah, stay safe, good. stay away from the virus and uh, uh, be good. Bye, guys. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye-bye.